Most of us would agree that it was the event that shaped our nation more than any in the last 20 years. And I'm not speaking of the Arkansas Texas game last night. <laughs> I know what some of you were thinking. You'd probably have to be at least 30 or older to have some clear memories of that day, but even those of you who may be significantly younger know something because it was uh, indelibly etched in our hearts and minds, so it is still a frequent subject of discussion, and every year, in some way, it is remembered and it is mentioned. The attack on September 1st, excuse me, 11th, 2011, shattered our false sense of safety and security as Americans. It's the largest terrorist attack on our soil, the attack on the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, a third attempt that took the lives of nearly 3,000 Americans. Now, for those of you who are able, I want you to think back with me to the fall of 2001 and the changes we have seen. We can't begin to unpack the, the myriad of changes in our society, our nation, even our world, but I want us to think simply about the spiritual changes. The 9-11 attacks shattered the stability and comfort of our lives, and right after that, you will remember, there was a surge in church attendance. Sales of Bibles in the weeks immediately following set all-time records. Now, some religious leaders, when 9-11 happened, thought this was judgment for our apostate nation. I don't necessarily agree with that. I can't disagree either. I do think if you look at what is happening in our nation, our world, we're continuing to see the judgment of God in many ways, including the recent pandemic. I don't know if we're, we're in our final days as a nation with increasing judgment to come, but hopefully judgment will wake us up. Maybe here in America, which was once a Christian nation, maybe there's going to be perhaps a final, uh, another final great awakening where the church is awakened and the church is revived and many, many people are brought to saving faith. This week I was looking at the words of the 60th Psalm, the first five verses, I think they reflect where we have found ourselves as a nation on 9-11 and since. Listen to these words of David. You've rejected us, O God, and burst forth upon us. You've been angry, now restore us. Listen, you have shaken the land and torn it open. Mend its fractures, for it is quaking. You have shown your people desperate times. You have given us wine that makes us stagger. But for those who fear you, you have raised a banner to be unfurled against the bow. Save us and help us with your right hand that those you love may be delivered. I believe those words and thoughts expressed in the 60th Psalm were on the hearts and lips of many following 9-11 crying out to God to save us because we've been broken. But unfortunately, those, those cries to the Lord and that surge in Bible sales and, and in, in church attendance didn't last. It wasn't very long after the dust had settled that things went back to normal. The threat was over, so people, including believers, were no longer seeking to the Lord and calling out to him. Some things never change. If you go back and you look through the Old Testament, you'll remember the Israelites would grow distant or, or wander from their relation with the Lord, and as a result, God would bring judgment on them, and they would cry out and return to him, only to be lured away and turn again. Now, we're, we're not, I'm not trying to equate what God did with Israel to us. We're not God's chosen people, but we've certainly been blessed by God. And we have taken those blessings for granted, and we have turn from him. And there's a lot we could say. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time this week looking back over the past 20 years, and it's a pretty frightening slip down a slope, and it's accelerating. There's a lot we could say about the deterioration, uh, the, the rapid deterioration spiritually and morally in our society and culture of the last 20 years. But if we're going to speak to that, for us who are gathered here today, we need to speak 
to us, to the church. We need to speak about us, not about society, because when it comes to the degradation of society, God looks first to his people, to the church. And I want to say to you this morning that I believe the church has a vision problem. You see, with all that's happening, we have our physical eyes focused like the world. We, we look at the problems in our culture, the problems with our government, our economy, our, our educational system. We're concerned about injustice. We're concerned about foreign affairs. We're concerned about wealth disparity. We're concerned about all these myriad issues and problems that vie for our attention, and they consume our fearful thoughts, and they disturb our comfort, but none of that is really where our focus should be. We're in a war. No question about that. But as we consider our strategy for battle, as we seek to gain, gain ground, as we seek to push into enemy territory and push the enemy back, we're not accomplishing much. We're wasting a lot of time and energy because we're focused on the wrong enemy. Consider Paul's words in Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 12. You're familiar, likely, with the passage. Finally, be strong in the Lord, and in the strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Listen, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Listen, whatever evil we face in our world, whatever acts of terrorism, foreign or domestic, all the evil in our world has the same root and the same source. And if we're going to war against evil, we have to go to the source, we have to be on the right battlefield, we have to be on the right front in the battle. I'm not minimizing the tragedy of 9-11 this morning. There was incredible destruction, nearly 3,000 U.S. citizens, over 400 of them first responders, all innocent, lost their lives. It was a tragedy. But we need to understand as the body of Christ, there are spiritual acts of terrorism resulting in far greater carnage happening around us every day, and we have forgotten that. We've forgotten we're in a war. And honestly, a lot of times, if you look at the church, it looks more like we're on a playground than a battleground. You see, around you and me every day, when we're out from this place and out in the world where God has placed us, there are hundreds and thousands of casualties all around us, but we're allowing ourselves to be blinded and be deceived and thinking all is well. And let me be clear, by casualties, I mean dead people walking. There are people that you and I encounter every day that are spiritually dead, and these people are deceived by the enemy. These people are going to spend their next life, they're going to spend eternity in torment and torture without end, inflicted by the greatest terrorist of all time. They're dead. To you and me, to our physical lives, they may look alive, but spiritually they're dead, and our calling is to bring them to safety. to bring them to life, but our spiritual vision is so weak, we can't see death hounding them and clinging to them because we're focused on other things. We're in a war. It's not a war against physical forces that we can see. Again, Paul said it's a war against rulers, authorities, cosmic powers of darkness, spiritual forces of evil. If you go back in the very beginning, you can look in the book of Genesis and see where the war began. God's world that he created was perfect, sinless, spotless. It was untainted by evil. Scripture tells us that Lucifer, who was once a brilliant, beautiful, angelic being, chose to rebel against God and, and to start a war. As a result of his rebellion, his eternal destiny will be in the lake of fire, but not yet. Because of man's sinful rebellion, which began with Adam and Eve in the garden, but has been carried out by every one of us. We can't blame Adam and Eve. Every one of us has been a part of the same rebellion. Because of our rebellion, Satan is now free to wage war and his acts of terror and destruction on this earth and on mankind. 
He knows his freedom will one day end. He knows his eternal destiny is set, but he is going to try to drag as many people as possible into eternal destruction with him. Now, Paul said as believers, we're to be prepared to stand against the schemes of Satan. He has many schemes, but there are two primary schemes he uses in the battle. And the first, very simply, is this. He wants to destroy, destroy the souls of men. He wants to separate people from God for all of eternity. When God calls time, when, when life on earth is over, everyone is going to enter eternity. Let me say that again and make sure you're very clear. Not just believers, everyone, everyone who has ever existed since Adam and Eve, everyone who is still alive on the earth at the time that God calls time and it's all said and done, everyone is going to live eternally. For those who committed their lives to Christ, you've been forgiven of sin, you've made him Lord of life, you've chosen to follow him, you, you choose to live for him, you're going to spend eternity in a place called heaven in the presence of God, and it's the presence of God that makes heaven a perfect, glorious place to spend eternity. It's not the streets of gold, it's not the feast, it's not the reunion with, with all of your friends and family members, it's the presence of God. And only those who dwell in heaven will be in the presence of God. Well, if you don't know God, you might ask, why is the presence of God so important? Genesis, it tells us that God created man with a spirit. It says that God made man in his image. We're not made in the physical image of God. We're made in his image and that we're given a spirit. We have the ability to connect with God on a much higher plane and a much deeper level. And of all the living beings that God created, only man was created to know God intimately and deeply. Every human being since the beginning was created with the ability to know God. God put that in us. And so, without him, there's going to be an emptiness in the spirit of man. And yet, many have turned from God. Many have rebelled against him. Many have spurned a relationship with him. Many want nothing to do with him. And what's going to happen when they get to eternity? Remember, everyone is going to get to eternity and live for eternity. What's going to happen when they get to eternity those who've rejected him eternally suddenly are going to have their eyes open, but it's going to be too late. How are their eyes going to be open? They're going to recognize they turned away from the very relationship that they were made for, a relationship with God. And they're going to be assi consigned to an eternity in hell, listen, by their own choice. God doesn't send them there. They choose that. They're consigned to eternity in hell by their own choice where they're going to experience physical torment. They're going to live with physical torment for all of eternity, but the greater torment will be the complete absence of God forever. And they'll live and suffer for eternity in the absence of the only thing, the only one that ever mattered. Satan so hates God that he's on a rampage against the men and women God created. He wants to separate them from God for all of eternity. He wants to destroy them to try to hurt or punish God. That's his scheme, to destroy the souls of men. But I mentioned he had two schemes. And the second scheme makes the first scheme work very well. His second scheme in the battle, in the spiritual battle, is to disable the church. Satan's goal is to eliminate the opposition or the force that can help rescue the souls of men. And this is where I really want you to hear me today because the majority of you here in this room today know Christ, you're part of the church, you're a follower of Christ, you're a disciple of Christ, you're a soldier. And Satan is going to do everything he can to take me and you out of the battle so he can continue to destroy the souls of men and take more people into an eternal hell with him. What's his strategy? I think there are two very effective strategies he uses to neutralize the church, and the first is to sideline us with sin. Take us out of the battle to wound us with sin. You see, Satan cannot have you if you belong to Christ. Your, your soul is secure. 
Your salvation is eternal because your salvation is based on what Christ did on the cross, not what you can or might do for God. You, you haven't earned it. You, you don't deserve it. You can't lose it on your own merit. Now, now let me clarify, because there are many people that, that take the name. There are many people that claim to be Christian. Let me clarify what I mean. It's not just saying it with your lips or with your mouth. If you have truly committed your life to Christ, you've completely surrendered your life to the lordship of Christ. If there is evidence of sanctification in your life, then you belong to Christ. Sanctification being made more and more holy, being made more and more like Christ, looking more and more in the image of Christ. doesn't mean you're perfect, but it means if we examine your life over the course of time, it's clear that Christ is Lord. It's clear that you're obeying him. It's clear that you're living for him. That's sanctification. And I'm going to tell you, you can know you can know that a person has been justified, has been made right with Christ. Christ has forgiven sin and done a work in their life. You can know they've been justified if you can see the sanctification process occurring. And I say that because I can't tell you how many times I talk to people that come to me about a family member, usually a son or daughter, that are living a completely godless life, and they'll make a, a statement like this, well, I know they're saved because I was there when they prayed the prayer. That's just words if it's not the intent of the heart. And I'm careful not to make them feel hopeless and not to, not to uh, make them feel bad, but I have to say, look, if there's no sanctification occurring, if there's no Christ-likeness of work in their life, they haven't been justified. Their life hasn't changed. So what I'm saying this morning when I talk about for those who've committed their life to Christ, I'm saying that there's clear evidence that you're a child of God. There's clear evidence the Spirit of God is living in you. And if that's the case, you're, you're sealed by the Spirit of God. You're eternally secure. You're not going to lose your salvation. But even one sin as a believer, while your relation with God will never change, even one sin can cause you to be rendered ineffective for battle. Relationship doesn't change, but fellowship with God is broken by sin. And when your fellowship with God is broken, your power is cut off. You're on the sidelines, which is exactly what Satan wants to do to keep you from being effective in reaching and saving and leading people who are destined to death, leading them to life. Satan's strategy for you and me to deceive us, just like he did Eve in the garden. He'll tell you that, that these commands are not important, archaic. We don't have to live that way anymore. He'll tell you that one little sin isn't going to hurt anything or anybody. He will try to cause you to doubt the Word of God. Listen, either it's all true or none of it's true. This, this is not a, a cafeteria buffet where you get to go through and pick and choose what you believe and what you want to live and the things that don't like or don't line up with your life. You can say, well, that, that's not important. That's, that's not, that part of the Bible's not true. If you're familiar with the Ephesians 6 passage I read earlier concerning our battle with the forces of darkness, you'll recall that Paul goes on to list the armor that is available to believers, and I don't have time to unpack all that armor today, but I would remind you there's only one offensive weapon in the list. What is it? It's the sword. It's the Word of God. That's the only offensive weapon we have, and I would submit to you this morning, if you don't know the Word, if you don't live by and obey the Word, it's fairly, fairly easy for Satan to pick you off in the battle. We have to keep our focus on the Word of God. And, and let me say this too, the Word is this book. We need to know it, we need to live it. The Word, if you'll remember in Scripture, in John chapter 1, the Word also refers to the Lord Jesus. We've got to keep our focus on the commands of the Word of God. And as we said a couple of weeks ago, you remember when those disciples were in the storm, the reason Peter began to sink is because he took his focus off the Lord Jesus. 
Listen to Paul's warning and encouragement to the Romans about living godly lives. He said it this way, Romans chapter 13, verse 14, put on the Lord Jesus. In the previous verses, he's talked about putting off all of the junk that was part of our sinful nature. All the things that displease and dishonor God, just like taking off dirty clothes, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, listen, and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Don't even think about how to gratify your flesh. You know, a soldier in battle doesn't make it his objective to only get shot a little bit. What's his objective? Not to get shot at all. That should be our objective as followers of Christ, not to give Satan the opportunity. Let me quickly mention, I said there are two strategies he'll use to disable the church. Let me quickly mention one other strategy he uses to sideline or disable the church, and that is this. Satan will tell us to relax if there's plenty of time. Someone said it this way many years ago, if Satan can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. If he can't sideline you with sin, he'll distract you and he'll take your focus off the clock. And you may be doing a lot of good things. You know, a lot of times we're very comfortable in the church. We're very comfortable being at church, being at church activities. We've forgotten that we're supposed to be out there in the war. We're supposed to be out there rescuing men and women. So we get very comfortable hanging around at church things and hanging around church people. You know, if you know anything about search and rescue operations, you know that when a search and rescue is underway, with each passing hour and each day that goes by, there's less and less hope for life. Satan convinces us that there's plenty of time, and yet in Scripture we're reminded to be mindful of the time we have. One, one of the clearest admonitions in Scripture is in Ephesians 5, 15, and 16, where Paul says, be careful how you walk how you're living life. Not as unwise, but as wise, listen to verse 16, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Listen, the days are evil. We need to be making the most of our time doing what God has called us to do, recognizing the battle that we're in and recognizing those who are going to lose their lives for all of eternity. Listen, there's no way for you or me to know when time is going uh, to run out for a neighbor, or friend, or coworker. There's no way to know when there will not be another opportunity. There's no way for us to know when time on earth is over, when Jesus is going to return, and when those without Christ will be judged and condemned. We don't know the day. But as Jesus told the disciples, we know the season. Scripture gives us the signs to know when that day is approaching. And I don't, I don't know about you. I don't know how closely you watch world events and, and compare them to what we know from Scripture, but evidence seems to point to a very near end to earthly temporal time. Maybe we just have a few days or a few hours to rescue those being led to death and to separation from God for all of eternity. C.S. Lewis in his work, The Screwtape Letters, writes, there is a legend about Satan and his imps planning their strategy for attacking the world to keep people from hearing the message of salvation. So they're in this strategy session and one of the demons says, I've got the plan, master. When I get to earth and I take charge of people's thinking, I'll tell them there's no heaven. The devil responds, they'll, they'll never believe that. They have the book of truth, and it's full of messages about the hope of heaven when sins are forgiven. They know there's a future glory to come. The other side of the room, another demon says, I've got the plan. I'll tell them there's no hell. No good, Satan says. When Jesus was on earth, he talked more of hell than heaven. They know in their hearts that their wrong will have to be taken care of in some way because they deserve nothing more than hell. One brilliant little imp in the back stood up and said, 
I know the answer. I'll just tell them there's no hurry. And Satan chose that one. Church, followers of Christ, we've forgotten we're in a war. We've forgotten what the real war, what the real battle is, and that there's an eternal terror and suffering coming. We've forgotten that time is of the essence. And I think we've forgotten our real hero. Not to diminish firefighters and police and others who run into burning buildings, run into danger, but that's just a small picture of what Christ did. Jesus literally took off his kingly garments and all the power and all the authority they represented. He, he gave all that up. He did something much worse than running into a burning building. He came to a sinful, fallen world. He was not going to receive any accolades or any praise of men. If anything, he's going to receive the, the disgust and the curses of men, and yet he was willing to come. Those he came for were literally at war and in rebellion against him. They were going to willingly receive him, and yet, yet he came. Limited himself to the human body. Man, we're all, those of you that are 60 and up, I'm 60. We're ready to go to heaven, right? Man, we're tired of this limited body. He willingly came and took on a limited body. Lived as a man. Had nowhere to lay his head. Had no place to call home. Suffered every temptation we will ever suffer, but without sin. We, we can't say, well, Jesus, God doesn't understand. Oh, yes, he does. He's been through all the temptations, all the suffering, all the hardship, all the difficulty, all the heart. He's been through all that. And he became obedient to the point of death even death on the cross, from the Latin word excruciate, death on the cross. Greatest hero of all time. And if we really remembered what he had done for us, why would we not tell someone in desperate need what he could do for them? We're all first responders, some degree. People all around us, beaten, battered, hurting, needing someone to lead them to safety, to bind up their wounds, just like the Good Shepherd did. That's our calling. We're in a war. An incredible war on terror. We've got to respond immediately.